we are. Okay, off we go. So, I mean, again, um, you know, you and I are uh, quite busy at Kong, of course, for good reason. Uh, the adoption and usage of APIs is growing rapidly, but as with uh, any technology, it gets misused and abused in ways that are, you know, it's not intended for. And uh, in this case, it's quickly becoming the source or the main source of concern, I would say, for a lot of organizations. And if APIs are not growing fast enough, we now have generative AI and large language models, which are trained by APIs to fetch data, to allow interactions. So it is fair to say that the growth might be accelerating still. Uh, my question to you is that in your role at Kong, uh, you stay on top of these trends. What can you share about them? Hi, Ahmed. Yes, you're spot on, um, you know, for calling out the popularity of APIs. As we all know and we agree, uh, APIs are driving businesses today. They're making all those digital experiences possible. And, and you know, you're spot on. The Cloudflare confirmed your uh, theory that uh, the API uh, traffic has surpassed all other traffic on the internet, right? With this growing popularity, they're easily and also growing rapidly as the number one attack surface. And as you can see on this chart, uh, you know, we hear of breaches every day. So there are some unsecure, insecure APIs that was ex exploited, causing these damage to this reputation brand um, and also causing significant financial loss and data loss, right? So surely the attendees of this conference and thank you API Security Conference for making this happen. Uh, we are all here today to learn something and you know get a grip on how to secure your APIs and think about security uh, you know, in this, in this uh, popular market. Sure thing, Dina. I actually think the number stands at around 6 million per successful breach, which of course, if it was in charge of this, I would really want to get it fixed. But there are tools, there are, you know, technologies, methodologies, and of course, there are the folks who are responsible for it. So let's speak about process here. What is a good approach in order to get a grip on this problem? Yeah, let's let me start by saying, uh, you know, APIs are functions, and they're designed in such a way to do those functions very well, right? So they, um, you know, over the in years, industry has mastered or fine-tuned um, handling of the web uh, web security, right? Application security. But they're discovering, as we are discovering every day, uh, the APIs are posing to be a new challenge, right? They are susceptible to various other challenges. Um, it's being used or abused in ways that we did not think about before, right? So mainly, APIs are transmitting information, critical information, right? So, and they handle sensitive data, such as financial uh, information, credentials, user uh, information or personal information. Um, and for a lot of organizations, uh, it's it's critical that they secure this data, right? Maintain the confidentiality and integrity of the data. And for consumers like you and I, uh, it's it's important that uh, you know there's no breach and uh, our information is safe. So second um, challenge is uh, you know we're as we know the APIs are driving businesses, and in some cases they are the business. Um, business continuity is an important factor for for the organization, especially if you talk to the C-suite, they'll say business continuity is your number one goal. Um, so availability of APIs is critical as well. Now, we know about the, the process of producing good APIs before we even talk about API security, Vina. Um, we're familiar, for example, with API sprawl. So perhaps it's not a matter of producing new APIs, but rather new as well as existing APIs, isn't it? Absolutely, you know, it, it, everybody already has APIs, whether they know it or not, they're actually already using it. Nobody's starting scratch, uh, uh, you know, um, from a new place. So either they have homegrown APIs inherently, um, you know, developed APIs, or, uh, you know, through acquisitions, they have come to own a lot of APIs. Uh, but the biggest challenge we hear from our customers is the, is the sprawl, like you said, is they have no um, vision or uh, control over this uh, inventory of APIs, right? So they have, it's not in their radar. So they they don't know what they own. Uh, they're running, um, you know, multiple versions are running in different environments. Um, you know, because APIs enable this quick development and uh, bringing uh, features to market quickly, they are also um, target to being abandoned quickly, right? So you start a POC, maybe you forget about it. Uh, so all these unknown APIs are the biggest security threats for an organization, right? So if you don't know what you own, you can't secure it. So um, the second challenge we often hear is 
yeah, like I said, there's no active management of these APIs, right? They come and go, no one is looking at it. Um, third challenge we hear from organizations is they're unable to make any data-driven decisions because they're not collecting metrics. They don't know, you know, uh, there's no active lifecycle management. So they don't know when to retire an API if it's being actively used, uh, et cetera, right? So uh, the first thing I would suggest is for organizations to understand the scope or the sprawl, get a handle on the sprawl, understand the scope of this undertaking and, uh, you know, enumerate all the APIs that they have in their environments and start somewhere. You have to start somewhere. So, uh, you know, taking into account is the first step. That makes sense, Vina. Yeah, get a grip on a problem. Okay, get the lay of the land per se. Uh, fortunately, most folks have some type of portal, um, a registry, repository where the APIs are cataloged. Would that not be a sufficient place to catalog the APIs? It's it's a good win if they're already cataloging the APIs. It's you know half the battle, right? So, uh, but a lot of APIs uh, as the organizations grow, they you know they. It, they don't know about the API, so it's unmanaged as well as unknown in some cases. And if you look at this chart, uh, many organizations are in that space, right? Only a few can say that with confidence that they know all of their APIs, all of their APIs are managed. Um, and uh, you know, for the rest of us, our objective is to get there to get to that quadrant of uh, known and managed APIs, right? And now you need to identify a process that will get you there. So, um, and revising it as you go along. So you have to start somewhere. So to produce, to be able to produce those quality APIs. Uh, so you have to start with what you have, evaluate the risks, known for known risks, uh, evaluate it for quality and security, and, uh, you know, fine tune the process of where you, how you can arrive at that known and managed quadrant. I have come across uh, security posture management uh, technology, uh, Vina. Uh, they use agents and other mechanisms to discover APIs in, in the network. So assuming we have something like that, or we go through the exercise, now we know the scope of the problem. How do we then prioritize and evaluate those APIs? For example, let's say I look at this chart, I figure out the unknown uh, and uh, unknown part together, managed or not, right? How do I then prioritize those? What scorecards do I use in order to figure out which APIs to work on? It's a good start. Uh, this scorecard is a good start to where you can start. Uh, you know, remember we are pursuing a good API, which is secure by default, uh, right? So we, um, you know, and sometimes as the API teams are developing these APIs, uh, security is not their only concern. So now you have gone through the exercise of uh, discovering all the APIs that you own, right? Uh, for example, um, you know, you may discover that the API is poorly cached and um, you know there's no rate limit applied on this API. So that could cause uh, issues downstream, right? So if a developer, front-end developer, unintentionally, they could misuse this API, uh, you know, dropping uh, the performance drastically and causing an, sort of an outage. So here in this case, um, there is no data loss, but you're actually, uh, you know, there's loss to damage, uh, damage to your reputation loss of uh, productivity and loss of, uh, you know, your customers are unsatisfied. You know, that's um, interesting, Vina. I wonder, you know how we said uh, there is some data out there for breaches and how they can cause millions of dollars of damage? I actually wonder about this because this is not something that easily gets reported. You know, if the API is slow and you said you're not correcting metrics, that'll be a problem. Okay, so plenty of APIs out there. We get a grip on them. Let me ask the question again. Would it make sense then to work on external APIs first and then internal ones? Is that a good approach? You will not like my answer, uh, Ahmed. You know, I will say it depends, right? So that's that's something that everyone says. So it depends on, uh, it could work. It's a good start uh, that you're prioritizing based on internal, external. But I think that's a bit naive, right? So you want to evaluate it uh, for beyond internal and external. Uh, a little bit more sophisticated approach to that. Um, so I would suggest maybe you look at or evaluate it based on uh, known vulnerabilities, right? One, one depends on the organization or the use case of that API. Maybe you have a mandate to uh, move away from or use better encryption, right? So you have to evaluate it based on the security guidelines um, and uh, talk about it from uh, approaching it methodically. And we heard from Paddy in the last uh, session uh, he talked about uh, forming a security council for LLMs, 
you know, and, and it's very important for even for APIs, having that security or the API council that will help you guide through and evaluate and build guidelines on how you want to develop APIs and um, maintain that, uh, you know, the super developer experience um, and build better APIs uh, in, in a methodical way. Perfect. So this then becomes bespoke. Every organization will do it slightly differently. They will assign different weights to the various uh, aspects that we have here in the scorecard. Okay, let's assume then we have this prioritized list. What do we do next? It's as simple as applying a life cycle, right? So you've gone through the discovery, you've prioritized it, you've evaluated it, built a security uh, API council uh, to evaluate it, and now you have a list of APIs, right? Um, you know, you start in a place where you already have some APIs, right? These APIs are not new. You're evaluating what's already out there and operational. Um, so then you start by asking the question, are we collecting metrics, logs, and traces on these APIs? Uh, you know, do we have any observability on it to help us make that decision um, and evaluate it against, you know, whether those APIs are meeting your design requirements? Um, evaluated against the governance that you will establish, right? Maybe there is a mandate. Um, the existing APIs may be using uh, something as simple as uh, basic auth and key auth, or, uh, you know, you have a new mandate to move towards a little bit more sophisticated approach using OAuth. Um, so you evaluate it uh, for those measures, revise it, you know, make changes, and documentation is an important part, right? And in some cases, your API may be good, but you don't have enough documentation. So you document those APIs. Um, and, uh, you know, once you have all these measures or uh, revised it, you go through that process of actually making sure, you know, guidelines is one thing, uh, making sure that you're enforcing those uh, guidelines that you have set for yourself. Um, and once you have revised these APIs, now you're ready to promote it to, uh, to production and, um, you know, if you're already doing it right, you're already collecting metrics on the old APIs uh, and you can retire them, right? And this process doesn't end. It's it's an ongoing process. Uh, you will continue to evaluate it um, periodically for risks and security and quality and other uh, other things that you may want to extend the API to do. So it's, it's an ongoing process. That sounds practical, Vina. I also like the nod we have for testing and our friends at API Sec and the important testing that they work on. Now, I do not see this process as being limiting for developers. Uh, sometimes developers get a little bit anxious when they see a, a process and they think it's limiting, but I don't, I don't see it as limiting. I would say perhaps if we have something like this, it would even make the production of APIs faster and reduce the overall effort because we don't have to go and revisit things. Yeah, once you have this process, this process is uh, meant to be lightweight, right? It's not a heavy process. It need not be a heavy process that all the developers will uh, you know, uh, cringe. So uh, the idea is you um, have it so fine-tuned that you know your developers are enjoying it, and uh, it'll help you produce quality APIs um, every time. And you know, besides making the developers more productive, um, you're also making sure or keeping an eye on that uh, risk profile. And sometimes you know you, you've done all this exercise, but it may not be that you're always hundred percent. Uh, secure or you can sleep uh, at night uh, you know saying that oh you know i'm secure and i don't need to worry about uh, anything else uh, the idea or the aim here is to reduce that to as low you know minimum level uh, as possible so you can you can handle it for your organization so uh, you want to adopt good tools that will help you help make this possible and uh, uh, you know uh, keep iterating on it Gotcha. So once again, realistic, you know, not over promising here that do this and, and you'll be perfect, but at least, you know, you're doing something and you're bringing the level down to be manageable or, or at least to, to not be a flagrant, uh, let's say, mistake. So now that we have a high level process uh, and an API life cycle in place, can we talk about the security pillars that folks should consider as their guide? Let's call them security principles for API security. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, um, everyone probably here is familiar with OS top 10, uh, but what I would like to do is take a step back and talk about, uh, uh, you know, even more fundamental, like you said, at the fundamental level, talk about the core information security principles that we can build off of. Um, and it's, this is not something that we are making up here, Ahmed, as, uh, as you can see, we have links 
that viewers can go and read about the security uh, principles. Uh, so let's talk about that in that context. The first one is confidentiality, right? Uh, confidentiality is ensuring that you're always communicating, uh, you know, whatever you communicate is not being uh, overheard or stolen, or it makes no sense even after you have done so, right? So that's pictured right there, um, talks about uh, passing the information. And as you know, APIs are moving data, right? So they are moving information from one place to the other, and you want to ensure that there is confidentiality in that transaction and nobody else is able to hear and uh, get in the, in, in, in the middle of it and uh, uh, able to understand what you're talking. So securing the channel is very important, regardless of which app, uh, which uh, protocol you may be using. You may be using REST APIs, uh, HTTP, or you may be using uh, gRPC services. Regardless, you want to have that communication on, on, uh, on a secure channel. So that one is easy enough, Ina. The data is encrypted, and only those um, on the ends of the communication know what is being sent and received. Um, OK, so we make sure all our APIs use acceptable encryption. What's the next pillar? Let's do another pillar. The next one is a very important one, uh, as all these pillars are, uh, authentication, right? So now we are talking about the two people. Now they need to authenticate to themselves, uh, to each other. Uh, that's like kind of the zero trust approach. Um, as a consumer, uh, or for an API, there's a consumer and there's a producer, right? So, and both need to authenticate to each other. Um, so, as a consumer, you may be accessing a service and you want to be sure that you're not accessing something that's compromised. So, in, in the browser, it's easy. You're going to look at that lock symbol uh, and ensure that you're talking to the right service. You may even check with certificates. The same thing kind of extends to the APIs as well, right? So, you want to make sure you're talking to the uh, appropriate server. You can do a lookup on the certificates. Uh, the APIs can, uh, the clients can do the certificate lookup and ensure they're talking to the right certificates, um, to the right servers. I understand how a consumer can verify the um, the server where the API lives. Of course, that's important. We don't want to go, we think we're calling one API, but we get to call another. Uh, how about the other way around? Uh, how does the server know who the consumer is? So uh, there are many ways, uh, um, depends on the, uh, uh, maturity of an organization, where they are with the API maturity model. The simplest one is the basic auth, right? Where you're using a username and a password. Uh, then there are there is API key, using the API keys, which is very popular. Um, and if you're a little bit more uh, mature uh, in your uh, in your uh, API designs and approach, you will be using uh, OAuth 2, or uh, even you can, you know, for that zero trust approach, you could use MTLS, wherein the server is also verifying who you, who the consumer is. You don't want to entertain requests from everyone. So you want to only talk to those authenticated consumers. So you can, um, you know, um, many different options, choices to choose from, depending on where uh, the organization is. And, uh, you know, uh, you want to only accept, uh, reject others and only accept legitimate requests. These look familiar, Vina. Um, I should say I hear authentication and authorization. They seem to be used interchangeably. Surely there's a difference. You just explained authentication. Can you talk about authorization, please? Yeah, uh, as, as uh, you saw, authentication is who you are and authorization is what you can do, right? The first step is authentication. And after you're authenticated, um, authorization is about what they can do on these resources that may be access, uh, accessing, right? In terms of API, we're always talking about resources, things like you could be looking up an order or you could be looking up a customer. So you want to be um, sure that the consumer only is looking up resources that they have access to and nothing more, right? So that, that's what author authorization makes sure of. Uh, for example, you may be looking up uh, your own salary, uh, let's say, or an order you placed, but you, by changing, if, if there is not enough security around it by changing simple um, you know, order number, if you're able to look up somebody else's order, then that's not good. So that's where authorization comes in to ensure um, you know, you're only looking at the stuff that you have permission to look at. It's about access management. Makes sense. Now, do you see in this diagram, you have the open policy agent. Uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about that? I see it integration integrated also with Kong in this diagram. Yeah, uh, so there are services. Uh, one of OPA is one such authorization service. 
Now, uh, the idea of uh, having an API gateway, you know, it's become a very popular component in the stack today in modern architectures, is to move all of those security concerns or uh, up to the uh, further ahead in the in the line of the request, right? So you want to have the pattern that has been commonly adopted is to have an API gateway evaluate at the gateway, you know, the authentication authorization. Make, uh, and enforce some some of those security policies. Now, OPA it lets you do that. Built it is a, a open policy agent allows you to build that context uh, based uh, authorization um, rules and re requirements. And then Kong can evaluate that and enforce that dynamically on each of those requests that are coming in. So it they it can be as sophisticated as that, or it can be a crude level, right? So you can just do uh, some level of uh, authorization check at at the gateway and then pass it on to your backend services to do even a bit more, um, you know, deeper level of checking. So far, so good, Dina. What can you do? Okay, next pillar. Next pillar is about availability, right? So we talked about uh, how for business continuity, that's like the number one goal for organizations um, that directly ties into, you know, the service availability, you know, when your APIs are down, the businesses are down and it's loss of a financial loss for both uh, organizations and also uh, damage the reputation, right? So businesses need to think about um, designing for high availability and, uh, uh, you know, ensuring that, you know, the services are up it, and it, it need not be just, uh, uh, you know, um, targeted attacks like uh, denial of service attacks. It could be simple things like network outage or some server going uh, bonkers. So you want to plan for that have it be available and resilient to such uh, issues. Now I get the idea of the picture. Okay, that all makes sense. Uh, Vina, I think you have one more for us. Is that true? That's right. Uh, observability, we don't think about observability uh, as a security or an information pillar. Um, uh, you know, we talked earlier about how uh, organizations can't make decisions because they're not collecting enough data on, and, on the API usage. So building that telemetry data helps build those insights as well and uh, helps uh, organizations make those data driven decisions so you want to build that into your api so you can do uh, you know checks like you know how the health of the api the health of the service uh, how it's being used and how you can improve the performance and it, it could also serve as a first level of uh, you know by alerting by building those alerts when threshold is up or down you could it could uh, you know, lead you to as a first step uh, in some potential outage issues. Understood. So now with the pillars uh, covered, uh, I'm sure their application will have a broad coverage. Yeah. Uh, but uh, of course, there are going to be overlaps. Uh, how do these, for example, overlap or overlay, excuse me, with the OWASP top 10? Is that something that we can go over briefly? Yeah, uh, as you can see here, the OS top 10 list, um, I don't want to go over each one separately, but if you think about the uh, approach in terms of the security pillars that we talked about, you can easily map some of these pillars into, into uh, these threats that we see here. And, uh, you know, you can consider protecting the data, protecting the information, and you'll be able to check off some of the boxes. Now, you may use a couple of different tools to do uh, to achieve this. But thinking in terms of pillars will help you um, knock off some of these uh, security vulnerabilities. So uh, Ahmed, I want to shift a bit now that we have seen uh, you know, the general AI security issues. Um, we want to talk about uh, AI and uh, you know, LLMs. And I hear you're working on this cutting edge stuff uh, at Kong. So let's, uh, let's talk about that. So first question is, what is this intersection of AI and API? Sure. So uh, happy to cover this. Yes, uh, I do have quite a few, uh, let's say, engagements where this is uh, coming up and it's quite exciting. Uh, first, let me say the hype is there. Uh, you can see here the uh, interest in the graph is at all time high. And that was actually December of last year. I bet you, but right now it's it's even higher. Um, the poster child that everyone is familiar with is, is OpenAI with a valuation of over 80 billion. And I think the annualized revenue is around 2 billion, give or take. But they're by no means the only player. Uh, there are other proprietary and open source models. Uh, the use cases are interesting. As you can see here, uh, some of them are listed. And the promise is uh, for it to be a force multiplier and solve a whole uh, lot of problems and uh, bring a whole bunch of inefficiencies as well. Or excuse me, efficiencies, not inefficiencies. 
Uh, now, the capability and sophistication of the models is increasing as well. Uh, this is a nice chart uh, that shows you the trend both for proprietary uh, up at the top and open source models. And it, it might even seem that open source models are poised to surpass the proprietary ones at some point. We don't know. Now, these are general language models. They're also specialized ones. Uh, by the way, this graph is from uh, ARC uh, investment, so it's not something that I made up. But regardless of which model uh, is being used, it's just a simple fact that remains. Uh, and that is that all these models invariably will use APIs. If they're being fed data or let loose on data, you can feed them via APIs or you can point them towards the data or large data sets they will digest. But they can also be dynamic. So instead of just relying on what they already know or what they already digested, they can, you guessed it, dynamically use APIs to get information with a tiny matter. Uh, think, for example, if you're asking a model to help you plan something in the future and it looks up the weather forecast. You know, that's a simple example. So, so very simply, the, the more artificial intelligence we do, the more APIs we will have. Um, yeah, that's my experience so far, Vina. Cool. So uh, given this, um, at, at the mode uh, AI, the mode API, do these AI, API, AI APIs have the same security concern as, you know, regular APIs that we talked about? So yeah, I would say all the principles that you covered for us uh, absolutely uh, still apply. Uh, but I would argue that large language models provide even more threats versus classical APIs. Do you have examples of those? Yes, unfortunately, uh, it's early days. You could say uh, in many ways it's the wild, wild west, but you can see there are already some examples out there. It's quite concerning, especially when you add the element of uh, unpredictability of large language models. We're still beginning to discover what's possible out there, so they can potentially do damage that we haven't thought of, right? Think of it this way. A model is a, is a sophisticated search engine with tons and tons of data, precious data. Okay, so now we centralize this and imagine this in the hand of an intruder so they can use that search engine to get the information that they want quickly. And that's just an example. Another example uh, is if the model does something, well, then I can use the model to do harm. I can contaminate or poison the model. I can simply steal the model to do things for me that's, that are not for you. Uh, we truly don't know all the damage, Vina, that can be done quite yet. But um, you know, as a, a result, of course, we need to put in place the, the good protections that you already mentioned. And, and above that, any protections that we think that can be pragmatic. Makes sense, Ahmed. Um, it, it's kind of the same foundational stuff for AI and AI APIs. Um, maybe we can go over a few of these. Yeah, so let's take a look at the use cases or the typical architecture for those use cases. Uh, of course, because I'm a Kong, I'm going to discuss them in the context of Kong, but feel free to remove Kong and put anything else in there. If you look at the diagram on the left-hand side, you have likely what's going on today in most organizations. Each application or you know, uh, each hero in an organization that has an LLM product uh, gets out there, gets it done. They think of a few risks. They mitigate it on their own. Uh, speaking of risks, by the way, thanks again to the folks at OWASP. They published the top 10 top 10 threats for LLMs. That's a tough one, Vina. Uh, check it out, guys, at llmtop10.com. Easy to remember. It includes things like prompt injection, insecure output, uh, poisoning data, uh, contamination, and the list goes on. Uh, by the way, one of my colleagues at Kong will be publishing a blog to go about this in depth. I can't do this in, in this talk here, Vina. Uh, matter of fact, looks like we're, we might be running out on time. Nonetheless, I think we can wrap this up. So what I'm suggesting is uh, classic policy enforcement. Uh, so we can guard prompts, we can do adequate logging like you discussed. That would be definitely an approach to do and try to centralize that so we do it in a consistent manner. All right, cool. And uh, you know, uh, anything that we can share as an example today? Yeah, sure. So of course there is no uh, reward without risk. So here are all the rewards that you can expect from the LLMs and here are the risks. And then the countermeasure for these risks, at least the ones that we are working on so far, I'll briefly cover them. Uh, let's say that uh, we want to prepend or append our prompt to an LLM. We can ensure that it doesn't load or display data that it shouldn't. For example, we can say no matter what the user or no matter what the API asks you to display, if you find any personal data, make that obscure. Uh, if we want to take it even further, we can guard the prompt, absolutely outlawing. If we detect anything which could be malicious, we cut it out completely. We want to lock it down even further. Let's give templates for use cases that we know can be allowed. So we give all the power of the LLM in only very you know, few circumstances. 
Maybe another one, we can hide away which LLM we're using or alter the use of the LLM on the fly. So the developer doesn't need to know which LLM to use, where it lives, what the license for it is. It can continue to use uh, their uh, SDKs to do so. Last two examples, and I think Corey is going to give us a, a one minute warning is to transform their. Yeah, we're right at time. Yeah. Sorry, we got carried away, but a really interesting topic. Can I just wish everybody to be safe and secure out there? I hope this information was uh, useful, Corey, uh, whether it's for a AI uh, APIs or classical APIs from everyone here at Kong. We hope that you found the resources here useful and we wish you good fun with APIs, AI, and security. Thank you, Corey. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right as we were getting into the juicy stuff with the AI defenses, uh, leave us wanting more for sure. Watch out for the blog. And of course, the presentation will be available, Corey.